This is a download from the BBC. Now on File on 4, Alan Yuri asks how well protected are final salary pension schemes. Are you Richard Williams? You're from the BBC. We can have a chat to Richard Williams and we understand he lives here. A disgraced company director is confronted at his property about his part in a business deal which has left a pension scheme struggling. What's it about? It's about the takeover of the wire company. The pensioners are worried that you were instrumental in, in a business deal which ended up in them losing millions out of their pension fund. Yeah. Well, can I step back, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. We'd come to put questions to him about his role in what's called pension dumping, how firms get rid of their obligations to the gold standard final salary schemes staff pay into for their retirement, how come they can get away with it, and why can't the regulator guarantee the safety of your pension when companies change hands. There's no requirement to tell us, there's no requirement to come to us for clearance, and we have no power to intervene if people do. That's left many workers facing an uncertain future in retirement. I've got 36 years in a pension fund and I was hoping to get something like £18,000 a year when I retired and it's going to be nothing like that. Realistically, I'm looking at my pension being halved. We're in the main um, spring unit manufacturing plant at the moment. This is where we will take our coils of wire that we've made in our wire drawing plant. We'll then manufacture um, coils on our coiler machine before warehousing and shipping to the customers. Darren Rhodes has been in the steel industry all his working life. His current job is a senior role at a factory in Barnsley which makes springs. So the end product is destined for beds? Correct, yes. And we'll make over two million in a spring unit per year. Prior to this, he was at a firm called Carrington Wire, which was once a decent-sized company. We were the largest independent wire producer in Europe at one point, producing over 250,000 tonnes per year of steel wire. We employed over 100 people at the Halifax site, uh, where I was the technical manager. We had lots of very loyal employees. Most of the employees had been there for many years. I myself grew up through the business from a, a 17 year old, so I was there for 23 years. So, yeah, it was a very family orientated business. Darren liked his job and it came with other advantages. There was a good pension scheme. I took the government's advice, you know, as a young man, I joined the pension scheme as soon as I was eligible to, and I put as much money as I possibly could into that pension scheme. At the time of 1997, when it ceased to become a defined benefit scheme, I'd been paying in for 13 years then thereafter I continue to pay him for another 10 years. If I'd have kept hold of my pension pot, so to speak, it would be worth in the region of £250,000. The pot collapsed when Carrington Wire became insolvent in 2010. How the company went under has been the source of much concern amongst those who paid in all their working lives to fund a decent retirement. Hello, is it Alan? It is, yes. Hello, Alan, nice to meet you. I'm Alan Urie from the BBC. OK, all right. how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Familiar journey for you, then? Oh, well, yes, for the last... Well, since we built it in 1997. You were coming here every day, yeah, were you? Well, I was a group engineering director, so uh, I went to the Warrington plant... Alan Hunton's plant, back on plant. familiar ground, here at the former production site near Halifax. So state of the art when it was built, 1997. I designed it with a colleague. My office was the um, far end office was there. It? Right. All changed now. Yeah. A giant Russian steel group called Severstol had bought Carrington back in 2006. Alan and the other directors thought both the company and its pension would be safe. We walked away from it thinking it was safe hands, backed by a multi-billion pound conglomerate. We thought we'd obtained cast iron guarantees on the pension. Indeed, we then paid two million pounds of the sale proceeds into the pension fund when we left it. Slight deficit, uh, that was reflected in the sale price of Severstal, and it was only a few million pounds. But the Russians began to strip machinery out of the factory. Profits fell, and four years later, they too were on the point of selling. By then, the pension deficit had grown to around £17 million. Nevertheless, the Russians had signed that guarantee, committing themselves to honour the pension. There was also an understanding that any proposed sale would be referred to pension trustees. So despite the company's problems, 
it seemed the pension would be safe. The guarantee says that Severstal would not be liable for the pension liabilities in the event of a sale. Unfortunately, Severstal sold it allegedly for a pound without the trustee's knowledge, and that's where it all falls down. If everybody stuck to the rules and said you've got to approach the trustees, then that guarantee would have worked. The secret deal was done, and the guarantee was null and void. Carrington Wire went bust, orphaning the pension scheme. When a company becomes insolvent, there's a lifeboat. It's called the Pension Protection Fund. And for people who haven't yet retired, it means getting 90% of what they originally expected. Former employee Darren Rhodes says he's not going to get the pension he'd hoped for. The majority of my work in life and my pension contributions at that time are now obviously highly restricted. So my future pension earnings really now rely on my future contributions, if you like, and the contributions that I've made over the last five years into a different pension scheme. I've now got to increase my level of contribution to get a pension that um, I'd like to think I can survive on when I retire. There were some people that actually sold houses, etc., because they were so concerned that they weren't going to end up with, with anything. You know that's happened to you, or is that just something you're worried about? No, I know, I know several people that, you know, downsize house, etc., that kind of thing, because they were worried they would end up with nothing. So they wanted actually something for when they, they wanted to retire. So, yeah, it made a big difference to several people's lives. Companies go bust all the time for all sorts of reasons. So what really went on here? The new owner who paid just a pound for the business was a man called Richard Williams. And we've seen emails between him and the Russian group Sevastol. They shine a light onto the secret negotiations going on behind the scenes and the very revealing. Here is Mr Williams laying it out in writing. It says, if we go back to first principles, we are trying to avoid Severstal paying millions. He acknowledges we're running a risk that the regulator will pursue us both for contributions. And goes on, the worst case scenario is that after a protracted period of time, Severstal have to enter into a negotiated settlement. We are looking to save Severstal a massive amount of money. If Severstal stood to make millions, what did Mr Williams get out of the sale? He got paid £400,000, which was supposed to be to clean up the factory. We wrote asking for an interview, but he didn't reply, so we tracked him down to a place near Bradford. Mr Williams has a house which is not that easy to find, but after a bit of searching around, we actually have managed to locate where his drive is, and I'm walking down it now, and I can already see a very big house at the end of it with some electronic gates and what looks like a bit of a security system. <laughs> Are you Richard Williams? No, I'm not. Oh, OK. Uh, well, we're from the BBC. We've come right, to come have a chat to Richard Williams. We understand he lives here. He's not here, then. Oh, right. Do, do you have an actual address for him? Because no. this is the last one we had. You're not Mr Williams? After first denying who he was, Richard Williams changed his mind when challenged by my producer. You're Mr Williams, aren't you? Yeah, what's it about? It's about the takeover of the wire company. The concern is about the pension fund, clearly, in that company, and, and the pensioners are worried that you were instrumental in, in a business deal which ended up in them losing millions out of their pension fund. Yeah. Well, can you step back, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. He was keen to keep us off his property and outside his electronic gates, but agreed to give a somewhat uneasy interview. As I poked the microphone through the gates, I was at least able to ask him our detailed questions about the deal, the pension fund guarantee and those emails. It looks from a, a reading of uh, the information that you've provided them with an exit vehicle, I mean, a cheap exit was, vehicle, to, a, so that they could try to evade their responsibility. Is, yeah, and, and, and that's absolutely not true. I mean, one of the things about this is that we said we are not party to this guarantee. This guarantee, there was a singular clause, just one clause, that said if we sell this company, the pension scheme falls away. There was no secondary clause for someone to have to pick it up. Did you know about that guarantee before you bought the business? I knew about the guarantee when I bought the business, yeah. So, so you must have known then that that freed them of their obligations to I the pension. But that, it reads as though you're trying to help them get out of a I deal. I agree. It does look as though yeah, and I can, you're trying to facilitate and can, something and I can understand dodgy. That. I, I can understand that, but there isn't anything dodgy in it. That's, that's the stupid thing about it is there is absolutely nothing whatsoever that was illegal in the actions that I took clearly gone bad, hasn't it? What do you say to the pensioners now who've lost millions out of their fund? I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely devastated for them. I mean, I've ended up with, with zero as well out of this.
It's unlikely Carrington Wire Pension Scheme members will shed a tear for Richard Williams. His actions were subsequently brought to the attention of the regulator. They have powers to act in cases where there's been deliberate pension avoidance. So, what did they do? They forced Richard Williams to pay back money he made out of the deal. He was struck off as a company director for 12 years. He still argues he was an easy target who couldn't afford to defend himself. Enforcement action took five years to sort out. The regulator did go after the Russian company as well, but to the dismay of the Carrington Scheme members reached an agreement which meant Severstall handed over just £8.5 million, a mere fraction of the calculated shortfall. Former employee Darren Rhodes says that was a poor deal. We thought the pension regulator would effectively ensure that Severstall made good their promises and made good their contributions in terms of the deficit. Did the regulator fight hard enough for your rights as a pensioner? No, I don't think so. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They told Severstall the minimum contribution that they would have to make and they made that minimum contribution and then it was case closed. You're not too happy about that, are you? I'm not happy at all about that, no. This is a multi-billion pound company who make multi-billion pounds worth of profit. So, yeah, I'm very bitter. I'm very bitter about it. So why did the regulator settle for a lesser amount? It's a question I put to the woman in charge, Leslie Titcombe. We negotiate hard to get as good an uh, offer as we can on the table. But in the end, we have to weigh up what we know about the legal difficulties in recovering the debt in a uh, jurisdiction such as Russia, what's on offer in the terms of UK assets, the legal uncertainty as to whether we will even be able to uh, make our case in a foreign jurisdiction, that type of thing. In the particular case we're talking about, the decision was taken that it was better to settle at the level we did and at least crystallise the position and give certainty at that point. Why didn't you take this Russian firm all the way and go for the full deficit? It's not as though they couldn't afford it. Well, we took the decision that that was the best deal that we could secure at the time, weighing up a number of different issues and considering how far we think we can successfully push a case like that and achieve the best possible outcome for the members. Why did that action take so long? These are complex cases, so the investigation itself can take a long time in terms of getting the documents, reviewing them and making our case. But five years, I mean, we have changes of government in that time scale, don't we? As I've said, these cases can be long and complex. If the whole thing goes through, then it can uh, take a very long time. And I do appreciate that for any people who are faced with this situation, it is difficult and challenging and concerning, and I do understand that. The regulator gets funds from a levy drawn from the 6,000 or so occupational schemes under their jurisdiction. So expensive and protracted legal action against a large foreign company, perhaps through the Russian courts, meant a conflict. They would be using money coming out of others' pension pots. When we contacted Severstall, they told us they considered the matter closed and were not prepared to comment further, other than to say they'd fulfilled all their legal obligations. We specifically asked them why they didn't tell the trustees or the regulator about the sale until afterwards, and if they'd been deliberately pension dumping, but we didn't get any answers. There's a parliamentary inquiry looking into dumping and the effectiveness of the regulator and pension laws. The chairman of the Work and Pensions Select Committee, Frank Field, acknowledges the current conditions for generous long-standing work schemes are challenging, but he says they must be protected. What we want to do is to make sure that people aren't actually rushed into decisions about closing, cutting, destroying these occupational pension schemes. We are now in a position because of mega low interest rates and rising numbers of people who live longer in a real problem with them. How much of a challenge is all this? It'll emerge as one of the great issues. We've moved from a position of being the strong man in Europe, of having an extraordinarily well-financed and funded second pension independent of the state to now one which is struggling to pay pensions. And I'm anxious for us to consider to what extent should we be having an option where trustees currently think about how do we introduce flexibility to keep the scheme going, which doesn't make the new employer rat on us. But as things stand, it looks as though companies have got the upper hand, 
especially when it comes to the law. Euston Station in London. This is where the big new rail scheme HS2 will start from. And one of the firms helping to deliver that multi-million pound project is Halcro, a long-standing UK engineering consultancy group. In 2011, the group was taken over by an American company called CH2M. Halcro had a sizeable pension scheme. 3,200 scheme members, but only 500 employees. And a sizeable deficit, running to hundreds of millions of pounds. Despite that, the US parent initially agreed to support the scheme. But later, they changed their mind. In a worst-case scenario, it was possible that Halcro Group would cease to trade and the pension scheme might enter a, a pension protection fund. Chris Martin is the independent trustee in charge of the pension scheme. He says because of those fears that Halcro would go under, a new deal had to be struck with the American owners. A uh, decision was communicated to us that the parent company would only continue to support the UK business if the benefits in the scheme could be restructured. So there was no point in putting extra money in. It was simply going to be absorbed and the existing scheme was going to... Uh, not be viable anyway. And was it your view that the existing scheme wasn't viable? Absolutely. The trustees collectively have considered this, we've taken advice on it and we have expert advice that confirms that save for the restructuring of the benefits, how could Group Limited itself would cease to trade and would become insolvent. The deal meant members transferring to a new scheme with lower benefits or face going into the Pension Protection Fund, which would hit some even harder. Not much of a choice, you might think. The regulator approved the deal, accepting that the alternative was the US owner would walk away from Halcro and the company would go under. Trustee Chris Martin argues it was a good outcome. The new scheme provides the same level of starting pension for members. It just provides lower revaluations and lower pension increases. The US parent is putting significant cash into the new scheme. It's putting in a parent company guarantee and it's putting in some of the equity in Halcro Group Limited. That's a very major commitment to supporting a defined benefit pension scheme. So there are many other situations in the UK where ultimate sponsors walk away. This is not walking away. This is providing real financial commitment to support it and make it sustainable long term. But it's still a less good deal for many pensioners, isn't it, in the long term? It's, it's a, um, say, there are lower revaluations and lower increases in payment for members. I can understand that it was a surprise and a shock to many. It's disappointing that we can't provide full benefits, but we're absolutely convinced that what we are providing is the best we can manage in the circumstances. But what do those who now face a very different retirement make of this? Edward Evans of the Halcrow Pensioners Association says he's lost out. And it was Hobson's choice when it came to the new arrangement. We were just presented with a form saying, go into the new scheme, go into the PPF, both drastically reducing the long-term value of our pensions. And how much you've lost, do you think? Lost 30% of the value of my pension. So you've lost 30%, have you? If I look long-term over the ex life expectation of me and my wife, that's the present value of that. It's quite a lot, actually, isn't it? It's a hell of a lot. Bear in mind that, you know, widows get half your pension. It would mean that my widow, should she outlive me, she could be looking at another 20 years of life. You know, she'd have to sell the family home, etc., etc. There's a lot at stake there. There's a hell of a lot at stake, yeah. The reason the workers in the Halcro scheme had little choice but to sign up to a new deal was the law hadn't required CH2M to take over the pension fund in the first place. This only came about because of a very severe deficiency in law and practice which allows incoming proprietors to buy a business but without having any legal responsibility at all to meet the pension liability of the business he's bought. Keith Wallace is president of the Association of Corporate Trustees and recently wrote a report looking at the ways companies try to avoid or reduce their pension liabilities. He says the lack of legal protection at large for pension schemes when a company takes over leaves a big gap, which some firms are keen to exploit. All of the professionals have known about it, and anybody buying a business immediately has this drawn to their attention. The dialogue, in simple terms, goes like this. The pension scheme is not well-funded, 
if you don't make waves and are prepared to assent to a slightly different shape of benefits, you may end up with not going into the Pension Protection Fund, but getting 75 or 80 percent of what you were promised. The pistol is held to your head. Lesser of two evils, really. Indeed so, yes. This is all caused by the fact that the proprietor of the business can walk away from the debt. Is this any worse now than it ever has been? It's accelerating because the deficits are getting bigger. The problem is being seen as less and less controllable and manageable. The professionals are all alive to it. And it's become socially respectable to talk about reducing members' benefits. It's no longer the sort of thing which respectable businesses will not talk about. Given this change in attitude, there are some who argue for more legal protection for workers. John Rolfe, a former special advisor to the Work and Pensions Parliamentary Committee, says it's time to act. Pension regulation just isn't clear in the UK. There are all sorts of grey areas. There are all sorts of grey areas when we're talking about companies responsibilities to fund their schemes, in other words, how much money they have to put in to make good a deficit. There are all sorts of grey areas about if there is a parent company, particularly if that's an overseas parent company, what responsibility, what legal responsibility, what legal liability does that overseas company, that overseas parent company, have to fund the pension scheme? And I would like to see the law change. So if you buy a company automatically, and you know this, as you're buying the companies, you're negotiating, that automatically you have to guarantee the liabilities of the pension scheme. But you can see the concern there that it might stifle investment because with some of the deficits that are around these days, companies simply won't buy into it. I think that's right, but if a potential purchaser is not prepared to do the right thing in sorting out pension schemes, then maybe it's a good thing if the deal doesn't happen in the first place. And isn't that what you want the regulator to sort out, really, the deep detail of this? Yes. I mean, the the regulator is the only person who can identify and block loopholes. And that's one of the things that the regulator should be doing. The regulator also recognises the need for change. Leslie Titcombe says it should be a requirement for companies with large deficits to inform the authorities when there are plans to change ownership we have actually suggested that we may need new powers. That in certain situations, for example, where a company is being sold and the scheme is significantly underfunded, then it may be appropriate for the trustees and I to have to be told in advance about the transaction. And it may be appropriate for us to have the power to intervene in some way, which we don't have at the moment. There's no requirement to tell us. There's no requirement to come to us for clearance. And we have no power to intervene if people do. Intervention then, what what would that actually allow you to do? Well, it would be for Parliament to decide what it would be appropriate for us to do. But at the moment, if somebody comes voluntarily to us for clearance, what we will seek to do is ensure that any detriment to the pension scheme that is posed by that transaction is mitigated in some way by the parties concerned. So, for example, it could be that they provide extra security to the scheme or they pay some cash into the scheme, that type of thing. The vast majority of employers comply with the law and do the right thing. What we want to tackle is the particular limited set of circumstances where, for example, as as you identified, a sale can go ahead without the trustees or us being aware of it. Even though it's difficult if they're not told what's going on, they do have powers to chase companies to recover money after the event. But an investigation by File on 4 into another business takeover raises questions about their willingness to use them. I'm on an industrial estate in Nottinghamshire, among the remnants of a once proud engineering group, which used to be at the heart of the mining industry. The buildings are still here, but the company is no more. We produce mining machines for heading, which is running roadways either side of uh, a face. We did uh, conveyor systems and we also did tunneling machines. When we had 900 people working, we used to produce all our own equipment. We had a fabricating shop, a machine shop, delivering parts to all the pits that were in the country, because there were 184 pits at, at one time. And was it a good place to work? 38 years at the same place tells you in its own story. And how about the pension scheme? What was that looking like? Our pension scheme and sickness scheme here at the time when I worked here was probably unbeatable. Steve Cook joined DOSCO in the 1970s as an apprentice and stayed on through thick and thin across four decades. But one day in January 2014, he and his workmates were called abruptly to a meeting. The directors came down, said that uh, unfortunately 
this is what situation was. He asked the uh, receptionist to hand out everybody's P45. We've got an hour to remove our equipment and anybody who needs to come back and get the tools needs to make an appointment to come back in. And that was basically it. After 38 years, you never forget that. This company had been my life. I seen grown men cry. To see it finally come to this, how it did come to this, was terrible. More than 50 jobs were lost and the final salary pension scheme was on the line. So when File on 4 got a letter from one of those caught up in the aftermath of the collapse, we decided to investigate because nobody else seemed to be looking into it and there were questions to be answered. Dosco and the sister company Hollybank had been owned by a large German outfit called SMT Schaaf. Eight months before they went under, the Germans sold them under one of those secret deals in a management buyout involving three Dosco directors. And there's the first alarm bell, the secrecy. Former employee Steve Cook says the workforce would have even been willing to pitch in some cash if they'd been consulted, and that he put this to a director involved in the buyout. One of the questions I said to well, why didn't you approach everybody? We'd have all maybe had a few thousand here and a few thousand here and be part of it as a proper buyout, company buyout. And his words was there wasn't time, and his second thing that he said was that, I say it politely, he said he was bricking it, because his, his whole house and all the three directors' houses run the line for this. You know, you thought, well, at least they show that they're up for this. It turns out, though, that the three directors had only put up £100 between them. The workers found that out much later. So where did the money come from for the buyout? That was only revealed after the insolvency, and a creditor began to ask awkward questions. He also wrote to file on four with his concerns, so our next move was to go to see him at his factory. This is a traditional process involving sand and uh, resins and hot steel. Paul Duncan is chairman of the Bonds Foundry Group. We pour up to about three tonnes of metal into moulds and produce castings, which are essentially steel for the oil gas business. His firm sold castings to Dosco. When they went bust, he was owed money for an order, and as a creditor, he began to dig further. I looked at the creditor report. I put some salient questions to the administrator and the directors at the first creditors' meeting. There was omissions in the creditors' report, which I thought were salient in terms of some company loans from Dosco and also from its other subsidiary, which also went into administration at the same time, Hollybank Engineering. One was for £750,000 from Hollybank. Another one was for around £670,000 from Dosco. He was on to something. These loans to the new company set up by the management buyout team were actually taken out of the companies which were up for sale, Dosco and its sister Hollybank. Then the loans worth almost £1.5 million were paid over to Schaaf, the German parent. Not only that, there was a curious section in the agreement that the management buyout company wouldn't have to pay them back if the subsidiaries went bust, which Paul Duncan found to be highly unusual. That's an extremely odd clause to put in the loan agreement, I think. If your mortgage or your personal loan from the bank was cancelled upon declaring yourself bankrupt, that would be a hugely advantageous and attractive position to be in. It's perfectly legal to take money out of a company for a buyout, but only under certain conditions. The pension trustees had no way of checking any of this because, according to former chairman Alan Mockridge, and here comes another alarm bell, they weren't told. What was happening with the trustees during all this time then? Because you're supposed to be involved in some of this discussion, aren't you? That's right. We were kept in the dark completely. So you didn't have any influence at all over the terms and conditions of the buyout? No. What would happen to the pension? No, none at all. We were just kept in the dark completely. So once you heard that had happened, what did you make of it? Well, it's somewhat of a shock. It wasn't as though some of those involved in the sale didn't realise the effect all this might have on the pension fund. File on four seen part of an email from one of the buyout directors, in which he acknowledges... We recognise the deal is likely to have resulted in a material detriment to the scheme. That scheme was already in deficit. New figures obtained by File on four, but until now unpublished, put that at more than £35 million the day before it went belly up. So is this the main reason the Germans sold the business? It was certainly something they were quick to highlight in an announcement just after the buyout. The Schaaf Group will incur no secondary liabilities, especially not in connection with the Dosco Pension Fund. 
We needed specialist advice if we were to make any more sense of what had happened, so we turned to an expert. I've got annual accounts and liquidator statements and administrator statements. I'm at Frankel Forensics. John Frankel has been in this business for 40 years. Piecing it all together, it's rather like a jigsaw, really. You get the various pieces, you put it all together, and, and a picture emerges. He knows his way round accounts and balance sheets, and he offered a robust opinion of events at DOSCO. When you look back at the whole series of transactions that takes place, it looks as if it's been planned. What makes me say that is I think there are a number of things which are not commercial. The management buyout team haven't put in any money. The, a lot of the working capital has been taken away, and that's essential, and with nothing apparently available to replace it. When you put everything together to see what the outcome is, to me it has the feeling that the whole thing was planned. What's your assessment of the role of the German parent company then? I think the German company has probably wanted to distance itself from an obligation it would have had, if not a legal, perhaps a moral obligation, to make sure that the people who were employed through its subsidiaries and for whom there was an obligation to make sure the pension fund was properly funded, for them to be able to walk away from this seemingly without any adverse publicity and get £1.5 million or so out from its subsidiary in the UK, whereas if it had just closed it down, it would have had adverse publicity and not got any money out at all. So it's been a win-win for the holding company in Germany and a lose-lose for the pension beneficiaries. So we asked Schaaf if they'd, well, shafted the pension scheme members. They wouldn't comment or answer our questions other than to say none of the present board was there when the buyout took place. We wanted to ask the three British directors about their involvement in the management buyout of DOSCO, but they didn't respond to our requests. So what's been the impact of all this for those in the pension scheme? Despite the deficit, the pot wasn't quite empty enough to qualify for entry into the Pension Protection Fund. Instead, a large insurer has taken over the DOSCO scheme. Members have been offered slightly better terms than the PPF, but it's still not clear to them what they'll end up with. Former employee Steve Cook fears he'll be worse off. I've got 36 years in a pension fund and I was hoping to get something like £18,000 a year when I retired and it's going to be nothing like that. It's going to be nothing like because there's various other factors that are coming to play because it increases stop, so we're no longer getting the 3% a year that I was getting. So, realistically, I'm looking at my pension being halved. Halved? Something like halved, yes. And there are more among the 700 or so in that scheme in a similar situation. It may well be that no one has broken any laws or breached any contracts, but DOSCO scheme members and trustees insist something doesn't smell right. So, with all its anti-avoidance powers and promises to protect pensioners, what action is the regulator taking? None, according to the former chairman of the trustees, Alan Mockridge, who's appalled. I can't see any reason why the employees of DOSCO should suffer because the pension regulator just doesn't seem to have any teeth, he doesn't want to bite anything. Why they're not doing anything about it, I can't understand it. The reason that the regulator gave for not looking into the affair was it might cost quite a bit of money and, and they might not win it. Yes, they say they might not win the case, but how will they know unless they've taken it on? But I think, quite honestly, if they did take action, it would be a bit of a, a broadside across other companies that want to buy British companies and then walk away when things don't suit. So whether these chinless wonders at the pension regulator, whether they'll take any action on and it seems very unlikely that they will, it needs to be sorted out. It's a benchmark for the future. Even if I don't get anything, people coming after me should expect to get a full pension. The independent trustees now running the DOSCO scheme aren't taking this lying down either. They've had legal advice arguing there are grounds to trigger an investigation. So I asked the regulator, Leslie Titcombe, why the reluctance to get stuck in? When we are faced with these situations of possible anti-avoidance, there are a number of uh, things that we have to take into account in deciding whether to launch an investigation. With this particular case that you're referring to, we decided at the time not to launch an investigation, but someone has raised with us the challenge as to whether that was the right decision, and we are looking at that again. Are you able to say what threshold wasn't met for you then in making the initial determination? 
each of these situations varies hugely and we take a number of factors into account in deciding whether to investigate. And as I've explained with this particular scheme, we are reviewing that, that decision and that, uh, you know, that work is underway to look at that decision and to uh, see whether we made the right decision at the time. And I don't want to say any more about uh, that at the moment. What some people want to see from you is a tougher stance. Well, let me be very clear. We will pursue cases of anti-avoidance when we become aware of them. We will investigate thoroughly to see whether our powers can be brought to bear and we will then seek to bring those powers to bear and we won't be bounced into doing a bad deal. We will continue to pursue them to get the right outcome for the members and the pensioners. But despite the tough talk, there's reason to question just how far the regulator will go. In the last six years, they've launched only 90 of these avoidance investigations. A mere 16 resulted even in preliminary evidence gathering. And there's been only seven cases concluded since 2010 in which they exercised their powers to recover money. We were told some other cases are ongoing and that more were settled by agreement. But even so, from those figures, they don't look like the most assertive watchdog. Now, in the wake of the BHS collapse, the wider regulatory and legal landscape is being scrutinised by the Parliamentary Select Committee. Chairman Frank Field says they've got plenty to get their teeth into. I'm anxious to see whether those who are dumping pension liabilities are doing it because they get away with it, and I would be surprised if the Select Committee doesn't move to a proposal that we have a much-changed regulator who has the power to say, you actually have to come to me before you can legally sell your company and it won't be legal unless I've signed it off. But to do that, the pension regulator, the way it behaves, its operation, its speed, its attitude and culture has to change. The status quo can't remain. (laughs) 